Hi, y'all. I hope you're having a nice day today. My name is Blake Comerdiner, and I'm the VR programmer here at South by Southwest. Today, we'll be joined by Gabo Aurora and Angela Watercutter. Gabo Aurora is a world-renowned, award-winning immersive artist, professor, and former UN diplomat who works with the most cutting-edge emerging technologies, such as virtual and augmented reality, to tell some of the most important stories of our time. His work has made measurable social impact as part of campaigns for the United Nations, USC Shoah Foundation, and the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, amongst many others, and is part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He is founding director of a new academy department and lab dedicated to immersive storytelling and emerging technologies at Johns Hopkins University. Angela is a senior editor at Wired covering pop culture, she also serves as the publication's deputy bureau chief in New York. We're honored to have them join us today. And without further ado, please welcome Gabo and Angela. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I am, of course, uh, Angela Watercutter, and I am joined by Gabo Aurora. Uh, Gabo, how are you doing? How are, how are things on the other side of Brooklyn right now? Great. Doing great in my garden where I have very good internet. So Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, well, I mean, let's just start off maybe with um, you kind of giving some folks some background on what you've been doing lately. I mean, I know I've been interviewing you for a few years now, and I feel like every time we talk, there's a, a new project or a new thing that a new thing that you're doing. So, what's been you know what's been the focus so far this year, and how has it changed considering considering what's going on? Yeah, I mean, um, a really really profound change for a lot of people and also for us, you know, I've taken a lot of my, my XR work within a university, within at Johns Hopkins University, which has a lot of focus on research and had started this new lab. So, you know, I think we've been able to do things remotely and, you know, moving, there's been a shift I'm trying to make from making just one-off projects for a film festival, but to look more at products, to look more at trainings, to work more with the the health and the medicine side of Johns Hopkins as well. So just been focusing on that, but also trying to figure out what this all means and in trying to serve the moment, you know, how does immersive try to serve this moment without feeling, you know, opportunistic or kind of sensational about it. So just taking that time to think about it and thinking how we can be most helpful in that time. Yeah, and what were you working on sort of before this happened? You know, what, what have been some of the more recent projects uh, that you've done um, in this space? Yeah, uh, we, were, we were really, you know, looking at virtual beings and health. And, you know, now we're looking at that in terms of COVID and thinking about mental health and children's health. So there's something new we're thinking about that. Um, and so, you know, trying to incorporate virtual beings into VR, like Fable, like, you know, the USC show foundation had done with new dimensions and testimony. So, you know, that kind of thing was, was there. We had a project with, you know, in partnership with Google, with their maps division, trying to kind of think about map based storytelling with Baltimore and mm -hmm. trying to kind of figure out how that would work. So that's something that we're continuing, uh, to do. Um, and then I had a very big project with Human Rights Watch, which is a fantastic, uh, incredible organization um, around a campaign about disability rights around the world and people being shackled uh, against their will. And so that became a little bit harder because we were supposed to travel to Indonesia to do that. Right. But now, but now we're, you know, figuring out more development and storyboarding. So, you know, it's still, I think the importance of this work um, and the importance of what social impact and this type of documentary work means and immersive. I think people, I think still, still look to it because they know it can really break through maybe some of the numbness and maybe some of the information overload or info whelm or whatever. I read that word. Uh, where, <laughs> the whelm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, where, you know, we, we, need, we do need to find new and novel and interesting ways to understand data, to understand visualizing what, certain things do. So, you know, obviously that has a lot of impact on how we're understanding what we're doing and whether we believe it and whether we're compliant and would something in immersive make you just totally believe it, you know, and, and yeah. make, you, make, you know, change your behavior, which I think is the, the number one aim that we try to have with a lot of what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I understand you also have a little bit of a presentation. Do you want to go into yeah. that for a little bit and uh, we can kind of take it off from there? 
yeah, let's uh, let's do that. Um, and let me see if this works. So uh, let's see if I can. I think that should work. Give me a thumbs up if you see that. I see it. Yeah, great. So yeah, this will. I won't take too much time, and I, you know, I think the Q and A is more interesting. And you know, um, before all of this happened, you know, I was supposed to keynote, and you know, I had a tongue-in-cheek reference to my title of, you know, thank God there's no no money, money in VR, and I didn't realize what was going to happen. Um, well, there's no money in anything. No, I'm kidding. There is money in things, and it is a big economic crisis. And you know, I was researching. Uh, you know, things related to, um, there was a book on New York, it's called the, the Fall of the Great American City by Kevin Baker. And it really just said, you know, New York has been booming with so much money, but it was this issue of gentrification. And just, you know, kind of yeah. thinking about the models, the business models of this. So that is going to be something we can discuss in the Q&A. But just, you know, to start out with, this was a little bit of what we do at Johns Hopkins and, you know, a little bit more research focused. Um, and, you know, we, you know, some courses, we have a partnership with Sundance where we're thinking about the future of culture. And I think, again, you know, thinking about how immersive and how all of this and a lot of my work that I'll go into a little bit, you know, is future looking. And, you know, this moment, really, I think we can look at um, how we can think about what this can do going forward. And these are just some of the adjuncts and speakers we work with. I wanted to start out with, you know, uh, taking into account that, you know, when we talk about, let's say, there's XR, but let's say virtual reality. If you go into Google Trends, you know, you it is very fascinating that you have this sort of low plateau and interest. And it was funny because I looked at that and I said, where was everything before 2004? And I realized that I guess Google didn't exist, and there probably was some interest in the 90s. Yeah, right. But it's funny, my brain, my brain only is when Google started. Not joking. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, memory stops before Google. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Google is the big brain. And so, you know, you look at around 2015 and you see this sort of spike up here. And then, you know, it kind of dies down. And, you know, as we know, in 2014, 2015, there seems to be this sort of um, interest again that happens. And I think we all look to Google Trends. Uh, it looks like we maybe have lost Scott, but we'll try to get him try to get him back online um, in just uh, just a few moments, I think. Looks like we have Gabo back? Yes, yes. it does. All right. Yeah. Hi, Gabo. Yeah, I'm just going to do this on my phone. and I'm sorry, something happened. Um, please forgive us. Uh, and let's just forget about the presentation. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think it's better if maybe we can just have a discussion. And I really, I really apologize. I just want to let everyone know that we did do rehearsal and it's just Murphy's Law. I mean, unbelievable. It right. was everything. Yeah, yeah. Great. And, and, like you said, uh, hopefully it doesn't rain. <laughs> <laughs> but well, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe we can just start it out with some, maybe yeah, Angela, if you have some questions, but I mean, I think yeah. I generally, you know, just to give people a background, you know, I've done a lot of work um, at the UN and, you know, have always kind of thought about this work, um, you know, in a very different way that I think most of the industry has. Um, you know, when I started going into thinking about virtual reality, I was discouraged from doing so because it was about gaming and it was mm -hmm. about, you know, other, other things. And I don't think any of that changes now. I think it becomes more pertinent and it's more important than ever. And hopefully some of that early work, not just on my side, but it just kind of on so many people um, who focused and showed such great promise with the technology, like Nani de la Pena and Jeremy Balance and Chris Milk and all these people that I think, you know, we do have obviously some, some issues, but with, you know, whether it's headsets and all that other stuff, but I don't think we should forget about the impact this stuff can, can make. And, you know, it's funny of all the, I heard you guys were talking about what you're watching while you're yeah. in quarantine. Uh, for me, um, I, I was watching uh, Jean-Luc Godard's Masterclass, which mm, I don't yeah. know if I recommend because, you know, it is a little bit weird. Uh, but I thought there was a point in there that he made where, you know, he was talking about how it was interesting how photography was before, was invented before the Impressionists, before Impressionism comes out. And really it was a reaction towards that because 
all of a sudden you had these painters who made their living out of capturing reality, making portraits. And mm -hmm. that was that was under threat in some ways by technology and reproduction and, you know, the very Walter Benjamin type of idea. You know, yeah. when you think about what contemporary art is, it's a reaction to things being reproduced and, and trying to focus on experience and ideas, and concepts, and not necessarily the craft in that way. And, you know, I think there's something to be said with, with virtual reality in this movement as an artistic movement, because I do think we look at, you know, numbers and YouTube hits and how many headsets, but we forget that we do need to create something that would be unlike anything else that could be reproduced or packaged and sold in that way. So I think just to kind of keep that as a framework that what is the version of the impressionist now in the face of AI, in the face of Netflix, in the face of so much of IRL being under threat? Um, you know, what does this provide in terms of experience and movement and feeling? I mean, that's what I would say. Yeah. Well, you know, to, to spin off that, you know, what do you think is the, um, the the most valuable, most important thing that VR can do at this moment? You know, with, you know, we are sort of, you know, everybody's locked down or in isolation or in some form of, you know, shelter in place. Um, and, you know, it does feel like a time for VR. You know, what do you think would be, you know, what are the what are the roles that it can that it can fill and the, the purposes that, could, that it could serve? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, so much of that, um, you know, I'd, I'd read the, the Kevin Roos article and I, and I am saying that people, I, I don't think VR is just for escapism. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if you look at it in that way, I think that's um, very naive because, you know, we're, we're not happy being sheltered in place and quarantined. We want to connect. And I think, yeah, you know, I think something with VR that, you know, almost what it can do really well is expand your consciousness, make you understand, you know, human stories in a different light, make you connect to data, make you even, I think, I think, you know, social VR, um, you know, though people uh, think the verdict is out, I still think there's something within those spaces. Uh, I really like this experience half and half that's on the Oculus Quest um, that, and, or the Rift, where you know, you, you're just an avatar. So I really think the moment of it, I, I think the mistake is that, oh, we want to escape into other worlds. I still think, like Jaron Lanier says when he has his kids do VR, they do feel exhausted out of it. They're not necessarily addicted to it. They use it as one would a trampoline maybe, and it really has this ability to kind of give you in a different part of your brain or your your consciousness exercise and then it you come out of it with a new perspective on life i really do think there shouldn't be this duality i think it should be you go into that world and you come into your own world um and you and you are motivated and you change and you're you're willing to kind of make some difference in your life with it and that's what we've i mean what i found with my first sort of experience you know clouds over cedra a lot fewer people saw it um, as compared to some YouTube things I've done that have gone viral. Um, but we got more people engaged and more people who actually ended up giving more money or doubling donations or getting involved with refugees in Canada. So I think there is something to measuring this very differently. And I think if we just look at it as escapism and the amount of time that you are spending in there, um, I think that's a very poor metric. I think it's you do it, and then how does your engagement in the world change? And that's a little harder right now because we're trapped yeah. in. Um, and I think the other broader thing is, you know, this is always, to me, I know there's a, a headset issue. It's always still been a content issue. And also figuring out what this can do. Uh, I don't think you can, in order to sell something, you need to contain it. And I don't think we should be containing VR right now. I don't think we know exactly where and how it works and all my work and every project i discover very unexpected things so i think we have to continue to play and research with it in order to create um, different content and obviously that's harder in this situation as well but i think where it's going to be apparent coming out of this is that there will be um you know hopefully a greater at least understanding that some of these virtual tools 
are really important and that things like Zoom and you know other tools are lacking. And maybe there is something that's about video conferencing, but I think a lot of it is what kind of journey can we give people and how does it change our reality and how does it change our values? Yeah. Um, well, if you could talk a little bit, of, you mentioned clouds of procedure. I would love for you to talk about how you sort of made that experience of what was involved with it, because I want to ask you another question about the production side of VR, but I want you to kind of maybe explain for folks who don't know, you know, kind of what that project entailed and then, um, and some of your other, you know, documentary VR work as well, if you'd like. Um, and yeah. then I want to ask about that. Yeah. Well, you know, it was 2014, um, and I was fortunate to meet Chris Milk um, at a party, and I had thought about wanting to work in VR without ever having done VR, which I think is important to, to say because I think it captures the imagination in such a way that you intuit that there is something in there that would translate human experience in a much more profound way than we currently have at our disposal. And so... I had this idea that I wanted to do, which was to go to Zachary uh, camp in, in Syria. And I met Chris and he really loved the idea. And, you know, we, we created it together where he was able to give me a camera system. And then he saw, it was basically myself and Barry Pausman who we made it, we went to Zachary together. We just took a very proprietary GoPro camera for two days into the camp and tried to come up with a very simple story of a young girl giving you a tour of her life, um, her new life, uh, living as a refugee um, in, in Jordan from Syria. And so the, it was, you know, probably the first uh, doc in 360. Uh, Nani had been working before in Game Engine. And we basically put that together and, um, you know, it really, it really was, you know, Chris ended up presenting it as, at his TED Talk on his VR and empathy machine. It really mm -hmm. kind of kickstarted this sort of, for better or worse, this sort of debate on empathy, uh, a lot of refugee films <laughs> on, mm -hmm. on, in right. VR. And I think, I think that's, that project then was a part of a UN VR series that got started doubling donations. It started being used with decision makers. And I think it led to this kind of idea that you can get a return on investment on VR, um, especially mm -hmm. for NGOs and nonprofits. And that's something interesting to think about, that the first return on investment was probably a social impact doc, you know? Right. And yeah. that should be a hint of like where things could go. Um, but obviously, you know, then from there, I went on and, and then done things in Game Engine. And my first sort of Game Engine experience was a walk around experience with Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation called The Last Goodbye. And it was a Holocaust testimony where we did photogrammetry of the camp. And you could just be in those, in, in those harrowing rooms. And there you could see the real scratches. It was generated with 10,000 photos using some of the most incredible capture um, that was processed by MPC and Otoy and people who'd worked on, you know, very high budget Hollywood films. And so that experience, you know, won a, a Lumiere Award and, is has done really well and continues to tour and has been in museums and has done a lot for Holocaust education and um, and so from there then I've gone into social VR I've done things on uh, countering Islamophobia using social VR and Sufi rituals with music uh, where you play instruments with a lot of Sufi bands you know that was at right. Sundance and that was a documentary that was acquired by Dogwoof and has been distributed um, throughout the Middle East and Europe. And then from there, I've done things, you know, most recently with Magic Leap, um, where just did something on the eviction crisis, where it's an AR project, but you walk around a big cube. So it's a mixed reality installation that was at Venice. So, you know, we're, I'm technology agnostic in some ways, where I just get excited by emerging tech. I just yeah. think, I just think there's so much opportunity because, you know, look, at, from, if you go to the cave and people draw, a buffalo on a cave by itself it doesn't do anything but it's the story i was there i killed the buffalo the buffalo went here i slipped you know things like that yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think you know it's it really is the storytelling but the emerging tech is a canvas i think it's it's we know it's jank here we know there isn't the necessary some projects might just die on a vine i, I mm -hmm. magically I don't know what's going on now there. Will it have a future? And I still built it. We built things for the Bose AR uh, frames. I don't know what that's going to do. 
But I think what excites us is that we're learning something new. We're feeling new sensations. And, and, and maybe it's the, the, the punk rock in me. I've always felt suspicious when something is just a little bit too easy. You know, I, I, I want it to feel like it's a cult thing that people discover and we're able to give a really great experience for those who can do it. Um, and I don't have this megalomania of mass uh, thing, which I know it's important. I don't want to downplay that. But I do think we can't lose sight of the feeling, the experimentation, and the wow factor that you get from just being impractical with the technology. So th that's a little bit of like a background of what we do and what we continue to do. And I've obviously had a lot of, I can go make 2D docs or I can do podcasts, right. I can do whatever I want. Thankfully, do a lot of my, my work, but I've always felt like, mm, you know, I want to keep pushing this forward because it just feels like we're a part of a community and we're a part of something that I felt um, enormous amount of, of joy and enormous amount of intellectual stimulation. Some of the brightest minds like Sashka Unseld, Felix and Paul, Nani de la Pena, you know, just incredible people at the beginning that I think have kept this movement going and I want to keep, I want to keep that going. And I hope it continues. I know we're living in very trying times right now. Well, yeah, and that's what I wanted to ask you about was, you know, as somebody who's done, you know, documentary work and now is, you know, kind of always interested in multimedia ways to tell stories, you know, what is, you know, what can you do right now in terms of that, you know, like if you think about the way you make clouds of procedure or something like that, you know, we can't, it's hard for people to go outside. If you can, it's a risk, you know, there are all sorts of things. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a desire to document this moment, but there's also, it's almost it's hard to do in a lot of ways, you know, like, are there methods that you could do where you could take a 360 camera out and say like, this is what Times Square looks like right now, or this is what, you know, I mean, I think people have a sense, but you know, is there a way that we can document this for VR, XR, AR, you know, any of those sort of things um, so that we can kind of relate to people what this felt like years from now? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I've, you know, I also teach, um, and have to think about it and had to adapt very quickly. Um, you know, I've, I've been very excited by WebXR and I've been very excited by Mozilla Hubs. Um, I've been very excited by, you know, other companies like um, that have gotten in touch with us, like this company called Geometry that is kind of like a Squarespace for game engine. Obviously it doesn't do things at the same polish, but you'd be surprised how a lot of our students were able to take things off of Sketchfab and find a lot of 360 assets and, and, and try to like come up with new ways to kind of, again, create that feeling. Uh, and some of them who don't have headsets even find it interesting within the browser. And I, and I think using that was really great. Um, I think, you know, with the new iPhones and the iPads with the lighter scanners, um, there's, a, there's an app called Displayland uh, out of a company called the Ubiquity 6, um, which I'm a really big fan of. And it, it's just fantastic what you can do to scan your own space and then, and then make it, you know, add your own 2D photos or 2D videos or other things that kind of go into that virtual space. So I think there are a lot of, um, a lot of people doing that um, and, and trying to integrate it. I know James George um, of Depth Kit also has been playing around to integrate Depth Kit into Display Lens. So I think even in a lockdown moment, I've been seeing some very profound and interesting immersive art um, that's been coming out. And I think those are some of the tools that we look to. And of course, if you can go out, you can keep distance. Um, you know, some of the technology with the 360 cameras and other things have been great. Um, I'm doing a project as a consultant with, with the UN right now that's just trying, to, they had a 360, a high-res 360 video, sorry, a photo of the General Assembly Hall. It's where everybody makes those big speeches like yeah. Che and Mandela. And so we're doing one where you get to stand there and like, you know, kind of give this speech, but then people are kind of Zoom bombing you, like children from the world are gonna Zoom bomb you. We're doing this like right. speculative right. science fiction thing. And that's doing it, you know, without really going on, on set, you know, and yeah. it just, it's, so it's, a, I think a lot of speculative stuff, a lot of kind of unpolished janky stuff is still very exciting and easy to do with just the tools you have in your bedroom sometimes. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's, uh, I think it'll be interesting because I do, like I said, I feel like there is this sort of, 
um, desire and people in this craving to, you know, document this moment and try to, you know, make sure that we know what it feels like. And I feel like, you know, VR would be a good tool for that. But, you know, because of certain limitations, it's, you know, it's a little bit harder to kind of make that make that a reality. So, but yeah, like doing things at home or doing things, you know, taking sort of outside sources and bringing them in, I think is a, um, a wonderful way to kind of, kind of, you know, move forward with that. Um, it looks like we're already getting a bunch of questions online. So I might kick to one of those real quick so we can try to get through as many of these as, um, as we can. Um, and this is actually, this is great. Uh, so somebody was curious about how do we uh, document the real life effects of climate change in VR for those of us in areas who were less affected and so that they can understand how the world is changing, which I guess is kind of what we were just talking about. You know, like not everybody knows what it's like to be, you know, for us to be sort of sheltered in place here in New York, you know, middle America and like, how do we use here to do that? But, you know, also for the climate change where, you know, if you don't live at the poles or whatever, you maybe don't see day to day what's what's happening. You know, what do you think of the possibilities there? Yeah, actually, that term I mentioned, um, Infowhelm, I hope I'm making it right. It was it, it was about a new book about climate change and how we have biased ourselves with a kind of um, we biased ourselves with data in a way that a lot of climate change is thought about with 1.5 degrees or two degrees and, you know, um, really has made a lot of inaction because it was kind of hijacked by a, a lot more of a, a numbers approach rather than a stories approach. And I think, you know, when I had to, uh, I've done um, a, a 2D, uh, one of the rare things anyone could watch of mine uh, on, on YouTube that I also did with Barry Pausman, who's, who's incredible, is called Keep the Oil in the Ground. And this was before I did VR. And it's, it has almost 2 million views um, because it, I just said to myself, we need to put a face and a place to climate change in action. Like what happens, you know? Mm -hmm. And we thought about the Amazon rainforest and indigenous people. And it's a story about, about a tribe and, and a young woman telling what happens when oil, you know, we, we drill for oil in places that we shouldn't and what it, impacts that has on not only the Amazon, but what that has in the world. And I think, it, it really resonated with people. And I think using VR in that way to kind of, you know, help people understand the overwhelming um, sort of abstract nature of it, I think is there's a lot of opportunity there. You know, uh, Nani, who I'm a, a big fan of and is the godmother of, of VR, um, you know, had done Greenland um, Melting which was also at Venice, which just showed you and brought you somewhere that you couldn't otherwise. And I think that's really just at the tip of it. I think really, we really need to think about things in, in figuring out how data visualization works. Uh, another experience I always reference is Ali Islami, who's an Iranian artist now living in Amsterdam, um, who has an experience called Death Tolls, where you know, he took all of the numbers of deaths of conflict during the year and he represented them with body bags and you just flew through these like imaginary areas just seeing what 60,000, what 80,000 deaths really look like. Yeah. And, you know, like that makes me a little emotional because that makes me think about how we become numb to what a number is, you know, yeah. and how VR could change that. I mean, I remember when I was, um, you know, studying philosophy and I had an ethics class and we were talking about my professor who would say, you know, people would ask always how many people died in World War II and then ask how many people died in Vietnam, which is, I think, some, you know, Americans, not, not Vietnamese. And I think it was something like, you know, something like 70,000 deaths, if I'm not mistaken, and approximately. And he said people would be like, oh, and, you know, he was like, they would compare it to World War II. And now we were always thinking 9-11 with 2,000 deaths, that was a lot. Now this is 80,000 or more, it's gonna be 100,000 with COVID. You know, there has to be ways to make us realize that this is not okay, you know? That this was someone's mother, father, sister, daughter, son. And I think, I, I think there are new ways of thinking about it. And I think with climate change, there, we don't focus as much on the climate change refugees or what effect mm -hmm. this has on drought. What effect this has on people? We just think, oh, our, our poor planet. But really, it's really a lot of people whose lives are 
are forever upended. And I think that's kind of what we'll need to continue to do. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and another question that came in, uh, says, what trend do you see being the most prevalent in VR, XR, and MR in the next year? I mean, obviously um, trends are changing kind of constantly now. Um, what could have been the trend three months ago maybe won't be now, but you know, what do you, what do you see? Yeah, I, I still am a, I'm going to put this in because I think we might have a, someone chopping wood here. Oh yeah. 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 We have, a out. Yeah, we, we have uh, lumberjacks in Brooklyn now. <laughs> um, um, the rural fights back. Um, but, um, no, I, I think to me, again, I, well, I'm not, I, I don't want to act like a prophet, but I do think about some of these things and I talk to a lot of people. Um, I, I think, I think I'm always still a firm believer in social VR. And I think, you know, there is just something within that of doing things with people that I found in some of my installation work has an enormous resonance and i think that's not going to go away you know i have a, a 14 year old nephew who races cars with his friends virtually on a game in what's a virtual wales like a welsh countryside and it's like they they communicate and they talk that way and i know Fortnite has that i i think i still really believe that some of that um you know spatial which is a magic leap uh, sort of uh, product um, is about conferencing that way. So I, I still think that's a trend that won't go away. And I think people will want to figure it out. We might not get it totally right, which is normal. Um, but I think, you know, Helsinki just did something, what, a couple of days ago, where mm -hmm. everybody through their browser went into a virtual Helsinki and the mayor gave a speech and there was a concert. Like, Wave VR has always been really fantastic. I'm like name dropping everything I love. I'm sure, you know, but but right. I do think it just shows you that this is a robust like industry and a robust sort of experimental way of things happening. So wave VR has always been amazing, you know? So I, I still think um, social VR is something I would bet against, even though some people will think, oh, it's not working right or there's other things. So I think that's a trend that will work. I think we're going to continue to see, you know, storytelling merge with products. I think, you know, Supernatural by Chris Milk is just, scratching the surface you know yeah. obviously you're trying to make it work for a quest so there are certain limitations of what could work but yeah. i think it kind of says okay i'm not, now i'm working out in vr but now i'm working out with other people in vr you know and you know you look at a company like mirror or you know peloton you know people like these live experiences and i think live virtual experiences will continue i think to be uh, very exciting I think the bigger, broader trend that I couldn't have predicted three years ago is just the amount of democratic tools most people can have at their disposal to start making stuff already. So I think that's going to continue to happen because I think we're going to have, uh, there's a boom in, in academia. There's a boom for academia is wanting, you know, research centers or centers around immersive storytelling, you know, because yeah. you need to have alumni you, you know, I, I don't want to even go into endowments of Harvard and Yale and, Prince, you know, you just go into university yeah. endowments. They're like little countries themselves. Um, they're always looking for ways to hit up and fundraise. And I think having something shiny and new and exciting and future looking is going to show that there's going to be a lot of tools for students and a lot of ways that a lot of people are going to pick up and want to learn this because they know it's not only the future of, yes, media and architecture, it's the future of jobs. If you actually understand this stuff, you're, you're going to get hired by, you know, a big tech company that is going to want you to understand this. So I think that's something that I think a lot of young people are understanding and hungry for. Yeah. And, you know, I think a, a component of that, too, is, you know, sort of accessibility. I think is the cost of VR headsets and, you know, any sort of VR gear has has gone down, you know, more people are able to get in. I mean, do you also see that, this isn't much, so much a trend question, but just a sort of, you know, future question of, you know, do you think that eventually um, more people can, you know, get accessibility equipment and sort of find the needs for it? Because I'm thinking about now with, when you talk about education and, you know, obviously so many kids are being homeschooled, you know, like they could be in a more of a classroom sort of situation if VR was more, you know, more prevalent. Do you see that as something that's both necessary and, I don't know if inevitable is the right word, but a path that a path that we could be on. 
Yeah, I mean, what I've just seen in the past three or four years and the tools that exist and the amount of um, kind of um, thought and money and everything that's going into it, I think it'll be an accelerating trend. And I think it really is something that um, is more, you know, we, we might be a little bit more hesitant, but, you know, I think there is there is just a big hunger from for people who might be just completely digitally native. I think they really are looking for new ways to make, um, to do things on, on with, you know, with an internet connection that's more than just, you know, social media. I think there is going to be a bigger sort of wave to kind of fulfill the original promise of the internet, which was right. to not just be um, this walled garden of, of, of advertising to you, um, where you can actually control and make stuff that can, you know, shape your experience within the internet in that way. And that's where, you know, WebXR, I think, um, is so exciting um, and will continue to, um, you know, continue to be be something that, you know, again, becomes, I guess, platform agnostic in some ways because you can just open up a browser um, and, and be able to use that kind of way of, of doing it. Again, it works at a different polish. That I've been seeing things with my students that is rather astonishing uh, conceptually what they can put together. Yeah, um, got another question from the box. Um, it says, do you believe that immersive narratives can be more effective than traditional narratives to promote different points of view? So, you know, is VR maybe better at you know getting to that that sort of empathy question? I think than um, uh, than other than other formats. Yeah, um, I mean, we've. As far as hard facts, um, you know, there's been studies out of Stanford, there's been studies with Google, um, you know, and there's been our work with the UN that has, you know, continued to double donations that I think regular YouTube videos wouldn't do. Um, so I, I, it does definitely ignite different parts of your brain, different parts of your body. And as I think it becomes a lot more sophisticated, I think you know, there is a lot more inputs that go into understanding what we're, we're doing to people. I mean, I always give the example when Facebook went from the like to the six emoticons of how you're feeling. Right. Um, and, you're, and you're volunteering that out because then they understand they don't have biometrics on you. They can't read your face right now. Maybe they can't. They're not telling us. But, um, but in some ways, they want that information because then they have more data points onto how to, how to advertise to you or how to give you something that you would want. Um, so I think with immersive, you do understand a lot more about a person in a very simple way of heat maps of where you're looking, I think can give an indication in trainings. Um, you know, I've been trying to pilot a, pro a project with nursing, the nursing school and simulations. And they actually said that during their regular simulations in the real world, they know that if someone during a certain procedure, if they're looking in a certain way, they know that has a greater clinical outcome. And that's now very easy to do um, with eye tracking. And having that, I think, gives more to educators to understand how, how things work. I mean, I know in a very rudimentary way, Zoom is using that also because they can read facial stuff if someone is paying attention or not. Um, and I hope everyone's paying attention now. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I think, yeah, so the, I, I think it is there. And I think we shouldn't be obsessed as much with that you reach fewer people because you might have more engagement. And I think we're always making a bet that the technology will catch up with us. You know, we are, with the Quest, we are having people rediscover our 360 work like never before, you know? And it probably has higher numbers now than it did when it came out three, four years ago. So there is a reward also in getting in early where some of your content might not age well, some of it might age extremely well. So I always say, is the work that you're doing an immersive? Is it a fine wine? Or is it the silent film era? Or is it just going to be Betamax or general magic? I and mean, I don't know, but that's yeah. what makes it fun. Yeah. Um, another question, actually, I was already thinking, uh, thinking of as you were talking about that. Um, uh, the question is, how can audiences uh, who can't afford or don't have access to a headset experience the joy of VR projects? Um, yeah, so without a, a headset. Um, I think, you know, I've been pleasantly surprised um, with a lot of things within WebXR and going into virtual worlds that way 
that I think even with an iPad, uh, when you have a bigger screen, can have uh, an impact that obviously is not the same as a headset. But it is something that I'm finding a lot of people are enjoying. Um, you know, one sixth of Finland's population enjoyed it to do this virtual event. And they did it mostly through browser, even though it was a VR experience. So it was simultaneous. It, it played to people who had a VR headset and then it played to people who could go into and use a browser. So I think, I think those are the ways that I think would be really, um, you know, a way to get yourself a good taste of it and to understand it. And then, you know, $3.99 for a Quest, and I don't work for Oculus, uh, is, is, you know, is, is, pretty, is a pretty good deal for what you get. And I think I'm astonished by what it can achieve and what it will continue to do. So I think the trends are going in the right way to start making stuff for, for certain headsets that could work in WebXR and also work on, on the Quest. Uh, and if you really want to, I mean, everyone is talking about, I haven't tried it, um, you know, Half-Life, um, that game. Uh, um, Half-Life Alex. Yes, which yeah. people can't stop raving about. And, you know, that doesn't, that requires you to be tethered and have a gaming computer, but you know, there aren't many levels to get involved. I think, um, you know, figuring out different ways. I, I definitely think something like Display Land is probably the more exciting version of doing something without a headset because you basically then create these scenes, you share them because they have a social feed on it. And I think you then put in other, you know, you can modify it in ways and share it with people that, they have a very interesting algorithm that when you push it out, it really figures out the camera move for you to make the best out of making your space look cool and dynamic on like a GIF, you know? Um, so I think those are, those are ways that I would really say, encourage people to try if they don't have a headset. Yeah. Um, another thing um, that's very, I think a very good question right now. Um, it says in the post COVID world, is there, a world, is there a role for VR to play in replicating the theater going experience uh, in a way that captures the magic of actually going to the theater? I mean, obviously there are sort of like theater simulations, you know, where you can just like watch Netflix and VR and it feels like a theater, but like, you know, is there a way to do it that's even more, you know, even more filling that void? I think that we all are feeling now that we can't go, you know, to, to cinemas. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know about cinema, but I do think for live performance, um, because mm -hmm. I, I have seen things that was, um, um, you know, there was something out of Sweden, which did something with their ballet uh, performance yeah. in 360 that I thought was astonishingly good. And it was at Venice. And, and really, you know, when I go to, uh, you know, the theater before COVID it is even more um, exclusive and elitist and to be fair, like it's not something I felt I could afford to do a lot of. And, and then, you know, I got these um, tickets to see Medea at BAM and, you know, they're really incorporating video and perspective and where you are, where I think there is something with capturing live performance. Uh, and we've just scratched the surface of that, um, that I just think, you know, I was, I went to the David Byrne thing before COVID that mm -hmm. he had on Broadway and, I was like, oh, this is like spatial sound and he's got everything here. We just need to like make his life inconvenient and do a lot of this in, in VR. And so then, you know, I have a connection to him and I got in touch with his people and he wanted to meet, you know, he's, David's really into, into VR. And, and then at some point they're like, oh, sorry, you know, Spike Lee got in touch with him first to do something in 2D. And right, yeah, yeah. And I, and I was like, oh God. But I, I it, yeah, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. Um, and, and so I think, I think, um, I think you know. There, I, I'm not answering the question with with film, um, mm -hmm. because I think that's going to be a little hard. Because I do think there's magic to being with real people on and with the screen. And I do hope that's the one thing I worry about the most. Because you know I'm a, a huge, huge um, moviegoer uh, in a in an obsessive way, um, and I think. The, especially if it's 35 millimeter and you get like this nostalgic feel, you know, I think film will become nostalgia like vinyl, but I think in some ways uh, the, the live performance, I think it's just, we're right at the tip of it. And I think it's a great opportunity. And I think, you know, the national theater in, in the UK has been getting unprecedented numbers and reach just for their regular performances. 
um, mm-hmm. in, in the UK and the world. And I know that movie theaters were starting to show those. I saw Fleabag on that, which was really incredible. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, that's something where I think there's more, that more can be done and would be yeah. excited people. Um, another question of when we talk about sort of IRL experiences that just came in that I had, I had not, not thought of and now I'm probably gonna think about too much is would, well, at what point, or is it ever going to happen? Will people feel comfortable doing, putting on like a public headset again? You know, like you've done installation, you know, a couple hundred people come through, um, you know, to, to see an experience, you know, at a, whether it's at a film festival or, you know, in a museum or something like that, you know, is it going to be a while before, I would imagine this, before we kind of get to the point where, you know, people want to do those, those kind of experiences again? Because I think that is a good way that, you know, people who normally wouldn't get into VR got that sort of you know that entry point yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah yeah it is it is the one part of the model uh location-based entertainment which i think people were doubling down on um because they felt until everyone had a headset there was a way to do that i do think at least in the short term i do think that's going to take a very big hit um yeah. I, I do think people will feel i mean oh People were always a little bit germaphobic before this, you know. Right. Um, there was always everybody was wiping down <laughs> whenever you went to the next person. Yeah. And 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 so that's a you know that's a tough one. Um, but but I th- I think it will be it will be a moment. I do think trying to encourage people to have their own headsets um, will probably be the mo- the bigger entry point that people make a small investment and that they can do. I do think location-based entertainment for a whole host of reasons right now um, is going to be at least hit, you know, at least you could say 18 months, right? You know, in, in, a, in a very safe way. And then it just, you can just change people's behaviors or, you know, people will just be a little bit more cautious. And there could be more compelling things at home by that time that would change it. But that makes me sad because I do think, you know, there is, there is just so much to experiences like The Void and all those other where you know where you get the most immersive experience but i do think that's going to be something that we're going to have to to rethink right now uh, yeah yeah um this does uh, question actually spins a little bit off of what you were saying about vr for live events you know like concerts or you know theater ballet something like that but then they're saying you know um do you see vr as having um sort of an impact on uh, social experiences, in-person, you know, in-person experiences, you know, in a post or even during COVID, uh, during COVID world. Um, do you mean, can you, do you mean? Uh... No, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm actually kind of combining two questions. One of yeah. them is, you know, using VR for live event attendance, like sporting events or, you know, things, that, things like that, that, you know, maybe people we can't always do um, or won't want to do in person for a while. Um, but then beyond that, VR sort of um, replacing real life connections that we can't have at, you know, at a bar or at a restaurant or whatever, um, and how that, you know, how that could how that could change, you know, if we start doing more social VR because you know bigger gatherings aren't as possible. I mean, I'm I'm as I still think um, I don't know how you feel, but um, I think we're going to again to quote Jaron Lanier, he says the best VR experience, he loves to have a fresh flowers when he puts on a headset. And then when he takes off his headset, he looks at the flowers and he's just in awe of the flowers. And I do recommend people doing that because you do get a sense of what it can do to your perception and what it can do. So I think, you know, I feel I haven't seen anybody really um, in my two months um, I, you know, I'm with my wife and we're mostly at home. But I do feel that once we start to be able to see people in a safe way, I think there will be a broader urge to connect and and cherish that. And so I don't know if they'll replace any of that. I do think once these things start to become loosened a bit, I think we'll have, you know, another summer of love in New York, uh, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where people will kind of, you know, find a way to to not, because I think the problem that we're having is these virtual tools are mixing, our, our home is mixing with our work and these virtual tools are mixing with our work and our play. Yeah. And that's just like, that's just really bad, you know, because I think we need to kind of have like 
not see it that way. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it can make people, it can turn people off in general to all of those things. So I think it depends um, how we, how we associate with what we do certain things with. And, you know, especially a lot of young people, you know, they, they, they hated Facebook as soon as old people started using it for awful right. things. Like, yeah. I think you're, it's going to have to be in the, the domain of it being something that feels like it's yours or something that's really intimate, something that's going to be, keep that there. So I, I don't know if it will replace it. I do think it will maybe, you know, you, it will make us appreciate what, we have or again like i said at the at the beginning a great vr exp i mean it's, i've always been influenced by books they're the original empathy machines and when you do them they're a little bit more you know inefficient but when you come out of them your consciousness is expanded you care about issues differently you engage with the world i mean there's so much evidence done of what literature yeah. does for for people and, and everything I, I look at that with vr but in a very different way where you come out of it and you're just a better person irl like you just feel and right. connect and maybe do things so I'm hoping that if people find the right experiences and they come out, that they do get more involved in different ways or care about issues. But I don't yeah. think it'll replace it. Right. Well, and I think like, you know, we've talked before about the, you know, the studies that have gone into, you know, sort of VR, like you say, as an empathy machine and as something that helps you connect. And I think that like when we can't connect with each other, there is that there will be that draw to use VR to just connect with people we already know and people we can't see. But like you say, I don't know that it'll replace what's you know um what we want to do you know in in person and in real life um but it can augment it in some way not to accidentally use a pun but um, you yeah know. and and there, and just you know on one thing with that you know i think people yes vr people say oh is vr the empathy machine storytelling plus vr is the empathy machine you know like we we have to think about it's not just the cave it's our ability to animate the cave and, you know, with our sort of thing. So, you know, I think that these, it's, I don't know if it's, if it's something done in a clever way that kind of has its, you know, and UX is storytelling, right? It's giving you values. It's, you know, the, there's something being, uh, you know, YouTube and wanting to addict you over and over is basically, you know, giving you its own value system of like, we don't care how much you're on this. We don't care about the rest of your life. We want you strapped into this forever. I think, you know, we want, I think we have to really look at that element. And if that comes through in a way with one of these sort of tools, then I think that's the person that's going to be great. I advise so many training companies. I do so much other, you know, to, to also pay the bills. You know, we, we do things with training. And it's amazing what a little aesthetic storytelling can do to make those things really pop and have better engagement. So, because a lot of the other stuff is not made by storytellers or made with an aesthetic sensibility. So I do think it's that combination and that early combination of kind of pioneers in this space with storytelling. They all came from whether it was journalism or music videos or filmmaking. I think they were able to bring in that with the technology. And I think now as we become more practical, we can't forget that. We can't forget that it's still storytelling and that meaning it provides that is is there, you know? And I think that's gonna be much more important than that's gonna get the true engagement, you know? I mean, it's what Steve Jobs figured out, right? I mean, yeah. he realized that he was in a very, you know, um, ugly sort of environment and just bringing in a little bit of design sense. You know, the short-term game wasn't him, it wasn't his, you know, and he had a lot of failure, but the long-term game is definitely his because people respond to beauty, people respond to, something that's well thought out. And I think a lot of that comes from an aesthetic sensibility um, in, in that way. And I think, not to be pretentious, but you know, Wittgenstein did say ethics and aesthetics are very related. You know, something is, is truly beautiful, it should be true also. And if something is true but not beautiful, it is not communicated. I probably made all of that up, but it sounds <laughs> Right. <laughs> I trust you. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, we're almost a, at an hour, and um, we have one really good question, I think, to end on here from somebody um, that kind of touches on what you were just talking about, which is, you know, what advice do you have for people who come from, you know, filmmaking or more traditional um, traditional backgrounds? You know, what do you suggest for them if they want to get into uh, what I think want to get into VR? Yeah. So, you know, it's been fascinating with this, um, you know, I, I do... I do have a background in film and I, in our 
program at Johns Hopkins that is also a, a traditional film and media department. And we've been looking a lot into virtual productions. And, you know, John Favreau did Lion King using a lot of VR techniques for 2D. And I think really understanding game engine logic um, is probably the number one thing I think a lot of filmmakers can do. Um, and trying to see, even for 2D films, trying to make things in a game engine. Uh, because I do think that's going to give people, one, it's the, it was already a trend that was happening and it's accelerating. Um, but I do think it's going to become more and more fascinating um, and it is relevant to filmmaking. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then, and then by, by byproduct, you are learning something that is a core tool and a core way of building things in, in VR at a, at a very high level. So I think to me, understanding virtual productions, those tools, those workflows, under, you know, taking a little bit of time with that just to try to make 2D work I think could be very fascinating. You'd be very shocked. Um, and I think a lot of companies and Hollywood and everyone is moving in that direction. So I think, you know, a Unity tutorial or, or any of those things um, can be, you know, can go a really long way um, in that way. So not, these things are all going to merge together. You know, I, I, I always liken it to the Mad Men. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I did watch Mad Men. Uh, and, I remember, you know, it takes place with, you know, the early 60s and then things move. And I remember when they have the guy who starts doing advertising and television and he just has this like very relegated small role in meetings or isn't invited. And by yeah. the end of like in four seasons in, he's at the core meeting, you know, and yeah. he's there. And it was just, you know, to me, I think a lot of XR, VR, all of that will be like that. You will, you will not be invited in the beginning and people will just think you're some niche thing until they realize that, wait a minute, wait. This is a spatial computing platform. This is going to change everything. And you're going to start having a role to play in everything. You know, it just takes a little bit of time. So that's what should be the encouragement. It's the best way to future-proof yourself, I think, is to get into this stuff now. Yeah. Um, well, that's perfect. Um, I just want to close by saying thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, I hope we brought um, a little bit of a little bit of a good conversation into, uh, into, your, into your day. Gabba, do you have anything that you want to... Um, no, no, thank you for joining and um, and apologies for the bit of a technical thing. I like hearing the birds. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank All you right. so much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Stay yeah. Okay. Stay safe. Take care.